previously on Stalin. He did a lot of economic stuff, like the new economic plan. And then the five-year plan. I think there were two of those. They did real good. Improved literacy, life expectancy, and drastically increased economic output. But there's a dark side. Stalin also criminalized homosexuality, made it more difficult to get an abortion or a divorce, abolished the women's department, and most of all, did some purging. And now for the thrilling conclusion of Stalin. All right. Next up, we get a crazy foreign policy bit. It's in August 1939. The famous or infamous Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Is this his, his pact with Hitler? Yeah. Okay. It is ridiculous. So how does this happen? First of all, the Soviet Union tried to get a military alliance with France and Britain. Ever since Hitler came to power, right? They're like, hey, sorry, this guy, he wrote a book about how he wants to like wipe out us and replace <laughs> us with, you know how like America, what they did to the Native American, he wants to do that to us. Like, <laughs> I would love it if that didn't happen. Yeah. Can we form an alliance to stop that? Right. But they refused. Cool. From their perspective, it makes cold logical sense. Why not let the fascists take out the hated communist government that you've been trying to take out for so long? So that kind of makes sense. <laughs> I get it. I get it. I don't like it, but I get it. Oh, yeah. It's just you got to understand your villains, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the story of multiple villains, I guess. But Stalin expects that war with Germany is eventually going to happen. They wrote a book saying we would like to get rid of the inferior Slavic races over there. So he's like, I'm pretty sure they're going to do that. <laughs> like, let's get ready for that. Uh, so, of course, they're like building up the Red Army. They're also rebuilding from the Purge, which like, you know, they did. They're also they also started to talk to the Nazis themselves. OK. To form some sort of uh, an alliance and not like a formal military alliance. This is a non-aggression pact, but it's still pretty crazy. And it is pretty wild. Like if you're going to say we're anti-fascist, like you got to get rid of the fascist guys. <laughs> <laughs> that one seems pretty straightforward. Well, that actually is what leads to the end of the common turn. Oh, is the Molotov Ribbentrop pact, because I mean, in yeah. the common turn, they've been telling them, okay, now it's the first period. Okay, now it's the second period. Now, you know, they've been changing the the lines. And the most recent line was, we've got to stop fascism at all cost. And then they show up to the meeting and say, JK, the war that's going on is an imperialist war. We have nothing to do with it. You shouldn't want to go to war with Germany. Are you kidding no me? And so, yeah. And so that's why uh, you have this sudden change. You remember our music episode with the Almanac Singers? Yeah, yeah. That's why they go from Plow Under and, and the anti-war songs and they say, hey, there's no reason for me to die for DuPont in Brazil. They go from that to round and round Hitler's grave so fast is because previously the common turn line, which all of them as, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, loyal communists were saying, hey, you know, that's that's the line is we don't have a role in this war. They went from pacifism too. Hey, the Soviet Union has been attacked. We need to get in. Interesting. One thing I do like to assume in this is that both Stalin and Hitler knew that this was not a permanent deal. I was wondering that. I wonder if it's just like, Hey man, I need some time. <laughs> well, it's definitely the atmosphere. It's like, I, like, I don't know. I assume intelligence more or less, you know, capability uh, on the, on the part of world leaders and everything. I mean, they had to you know, probably kill some people to get there. So like they're clever. Both of them had a material reason to do what they did. Yeah. This wasn't a, this is my new best friend situation. Right. And yeah, people, you know, anti-communists will like to spin it that way of like, look at stupid ass Stalin teamed up with Hitler and then just got bitch slapped afterward. And it's like, Whoa, like how did that happen? Like, like he had to have seen that coming. Yeah. They were, I think using each other. Part of the pact was that it, and this was a secret protocol. It carved up spheres of influence for each country in Poland and the Baltic States and Finland. So very soon after the pact, the Nazis invaded Poland and this kicks off world war two 
And soon after that, the Soviets say, well, we're going to go in to help stabilize the other half of Poland. They're, they're going to go, they go in and they take that half of Poland. Oh, uh, okay. And so each half annexes basically half, and the Nazis take the opportunity to start their systemic plan to exterminate Polish people, Oof. especially Polish Jews, and replace them with Germans. So they're doing like the Indian Removal Act, but in, you know, a hundred years later. This kills more than five million people. The Soviets, in their zone of Poland that they've taken over, uh, they do mass arrests of Polish army officers, cops, landowners, factory owners, clergy, and intellectuals. My least favorite of those to <laughs> round up. The worst. No, not like the. I mean, like, oh, okay. don't you go mean... after the intellectual. I mean, like the <laughs> landowners, but. <laughs> yeah, sure. Some of those guys, sure. But come on, guys. Just nerds. Yeah. Many of them were deported to Siberia. Uh, lots of them were executed. So why did they do that? There was the argument that they would be trouble for the Soviet government there, that they would be counter-revolutionaries. They were disloyal. The executions include a very infamous one, the Caton Massacre. Oh, is this the one where, like, the drains in the floor? That's the one, yeah. Vasily yeah. Blokin, the most prolific murderer guy. 1940, 22,000 POWs executed by the NKVD. Uh, that's a lot, uh, the Soviets maintained, and this is sort of still controversial and very hardline communist circles will say, all right, um, you want me to walk off the plank for the, for the tankies here? Um, <laughs> there's a guy named Grover Fur who writes, I think he writes pretty well. He's a historian, but his, he, he kind of comes to some interesting conclusions with his sources and, and usually just generally exonerates the Soviet Union and in particular Stalin. Yeah. Like in most it's cases. Stalin, bro. Yeah. And so hardliners will say the Caton massacre was done by the Nazis and like blamed on the Soviets, but it does wow. seem, yeah, it does seem that the historical evidence and the vast historical consensus is that no, no, that's just not true. Yeah. Okay. If there are more sources that I should be reading, please feel free to chime in and tell us. I will maybe take a look. I've got the summer off. I might take a look at them, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what I got from it. Okay. I mean, this whole Poland thing is definitely on the strike list. That sucks. Yeah. It's a lot of people killed. Now we just talked about the 5 million on the Nazi side based on a systemic program and everything. The Polish Institute of National Remembrance estimates that around 150,000 Polish people were killed by the Soviets. I mean, way less. I mean, I guess... Very bad, but, yeah, less. I guess, like, is the logic that they had to go take that over or else, like, the Nazis would take all of Poland? Yeah, they were worried that the government would fall and then the, 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 the Nazis would swing in and say, oh, we're just stabilizing the region. So in a weird way, you could be like, oh, they saved half of it. But, I mean, they kind of didn't, they kind of didn't. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's still bad. It's still bad. I'm not defending them. Let yeah. me make that clear. Yeah. I did want to put the scale in because people, you know, World War II bros will be like, <laughs> Stalin was just as bad as Hitler, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. And we're, you know, as you can tell, we're not trying to make the case that Stalin was good no, in everything I, that he did. Dude, but, the, the list has a scroll function now. Like, this is a bad guy. <laughs> yeah. But probably one that did good things. Anyway, let's continue. All right. <laughs> November 1939, the Soviets invaded Finland. That was on the list of, like, spheres. Basically, the Finns rejected a land trade. They were going to do a little tradesies of land to try to get more defensive territory around Leningrad. And the Finns said no, and so the Soviets invaded. The Winter War is what this is called. And it's really embarrassing for the Red Army. They suffer severe losses. They are fighting a way less mechanized Finnish army that's smaller than I was going to say, are. against Finland? Yeah. Like, what the fuck? No offense to Finnish listeners, but I don't think y'all are, like, renowned for your military prowess. Dude, some Finnish bro just slammed down his headphones. Like, like, what let's, the fuck did they just fight. say? What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's on site, as they say. <laughs> but in the end, after that kind of debacle, uh, the Soviets signed a treaty where Finland 
they, Finland ends up giving more of their territory up than they initially wanted to, but not like their whole country. And people disagree. They're like, oh, did the Soviets try to take over the whole country or just the little part they asked for? Who knows? But that's what they got. And it was kind of bad. Like their performance, there are arguments to show that like it convinced Hitler, like, Hey, these guys are, these guys are bullshit. Let's, let's take them over. You know? Anyway, next up, June 1940, the Red Army invaded and occupied the Baltic states. These are Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the little guys on the Baltic Sea. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> for, for our geography challenged listeners. I mean, it helped me too, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so they sweep it. So I say they invaded. It's not like very bloody battles or anything. They just roll in. These guys don't have very sizable armies to fight with. Each of these would become Soviet socialist republics and would join the Soviet Union later that year, 1940. Uh, Soviet historiography is interesting on this. It kind of paints these invasions as like liberations, which it's a mixed bag. I mean, like there were a lot of people in these countries who were like, damn, I'm glad someone's going to get rid of this like right wing asshole that's in charge of me. Uh, There were groups that were like, damn, I'm glad I'm not going to be as oppressed or whatever. But overall, like it is hard to, it's not a popular uprising or anything. It is just the army rolling in. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> like in Poland, there were mass arrests, there were mass deportations, there were some executions um, of people who were like anti communist or pro fascist or whatever, or accused of being them. The Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, so those are some of the immediate consequences. It also led to more trade between Germany and the Soviet Union. Again, they were using each other. The Soviet Union wanted German equipment while the Germans needed. Soviet raw materials, grain, oil, rubber, that sort of thing. But why did they need all those raw materials hanging out in Germany? That's not so hard. What do you need all this shit for? Uh, for invading? Yeah. You gotta, Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, need, you need fuel for your blood soaked war machine, which soon turned on the very Soviets who had supplied it. Well, that sucks. Yeah. Yeah, how long does this thing last, this this non-aggression pact? Non-aggression pact starts in August 1939. It is broken in June of 1941. That's not very long. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, Nazi Germany invades the Soviet Union in Operation Barbarossa. That's a cool name. I gotta give them that. I mean, I hate Nazis, but sometimes they have very cool names for things. Yeah, and that's that's a a recruitment into the dark arts of... World War II history that has <laughs> snared many a an adolescent boy. I'm sure. The names of the operations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You have that, you have Sea Lion. That's cool. There's plenty of good ones. There's some cool wolf shit, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> I've forgotten them all since then, but <laughs> they're, they're kicking around in there somewhere. <laughs> You've recovered. Yeah. Operation Barbarossa, they turn and they use all that shit that they got from the Soviet Union. And they're like, cool, that fuels us. We're going to take you on now. This is going to be, you know, brutal war history or whatever. We're not. Gonna, this is the shortest section of my notes. Hell because it's yeah, war history. speed through it. <laughs> the Soviets, just to, just to put this out there, though, what they do in the brutal defense of their country, they are fighting an enemy that literally planned on exterminating them. They had something called the Hunger Plan. Like, you know, the Hunger Games, but the Hunger Plan. <laughs> Wait, who's they? The Nazis, the Nazis did? Nazis. Okay, what was this hunger plan they had? The hunger plan was, it's hard to feed our army. We're going to go to war against the Soviet Union. What if we just starve them and feed our army with their shit? Okay. We don't want them around. We want to take over their land anyway. When we capture their soldiers, what if we just don't fucking feed them? Holy shit. That was their literal plan. Okay, that's pretty dark. To counteract their darkness, we have fight fire with fire. Joseph Stalin at the helm. Let's go. So uh, he orders a scorched earth policy. Uh, The Germans are rapidly advancing through his country because he purged so many of his officer corps. So he says, fucking burn shit down. You know, uh, don't don't let them have the stuff that we that we need. Don't let our stuff fall into their hands. He also orders the NKVD to kill around 100,000 political prisoners rather than let them fall into be liberated by Germans. Uh, he also moved factories to the east of the Euro Mountains to protect them from, you know, the invasion and falling in, 
into Nazi hands. That one's fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Again, why do they even have these factories? Rapid industrialization. Like this is the, this is the, this is the moment. Yeah. It's the prince that was promised for them. Like it's, it's their, <laughs> their flaming sword that they have to slay the Nazi beast with. <laughs> it's their only hope. <laughs> yeah. They signed a neutrality pact with Japan. Ooh. Now, Japan was very bad. All right. Japan did a ton of war crimes. Oh yeah. Very bad. But what this did was it kept the other the potential East front safe. yeah, of the Soviet Union safe from invasion. Yeah. Also, thanks to the James Bond of the Soviet Union. Who was that? A guy named Richard Sorge. He was the one who gathered the intelligence in Japan and relayed it back to Stalin. Hey, if you keep just a bare minimum of troops out there, they're not going to invade. All right. So super crucial. Let them focus on Hitler. Stalin also did really harsh wartime orders like Order 227, uh, which said not one step back. That was the famous slogan from that. Uh, they it ordered the Red Army to set up blocking detachments and penal battalions. Oh, no. I hate those. Yeah, so penal battalions is like you get in trouble for deserting and they put you in like the cannon fodder battalion. Yeah, yeah. You're the meat shield. Yeah. Blocking detachments is you are in charge of making sure the meat shields don't run away by shooting oh, them. Oh, fuck. Okay. This one probably did more to d detract from morale. So they, they actually did away with this in a few months. Um, they were okay, like, this, yeah. This sucks. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. Order 270 said never surrender. Shoot deserters. Uh, arrest their families. Ooh. Do not surrender. And if your officer tries to surrender, kill them. Okay. Wow. <laughs> that was another one that did, had a short lifespan too. Yeah. You already have like a decimated army. Like maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I think that they were motivational to the officer corps. Yeah. Like I can't fucking lose this battle or I'll die. Yeah. Maybe okay. not so much the rank and file. But the officers are like, holy shit, things are serious. Like, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're written in a pretty, like, uh, they're, they're written dramatically, but like in a way that you would like give a motivational speech to someone or something. Like, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's intense in that regard. Interesting. It's like a propaganda document almost. Uh, next, uh, Stalin led the Soviet Union in halting the German advance. First at the Battle of Moscow, then at the Battle of Stalingrad. That's, you know, the very famous one. Uh, and finally at the Battle of Kursk. And once, you know, the Germans dash up against the shoals that many times, then the Soviet Union pushes them back out of the, out of their country, out of Eastern Europe, all the way back to Berlin, captures Berlin, the famous, you know, flag flying over the flag flying over Berlin or whatever capturing the city, forcing Hitler to do us all a favor and kill himself. Hell yeah. That one, no content warning. Sorry. That was just, that one you should be happy about hearing. Yeah. You know, I mean, he was desperate to escape Soviet justice, whatever that may have looked like. It couldn't have gone far enough. Oh no, could not uh, have been good. And, and okay. So one thing, one counter may be Stalin. Hey man, he wasn't a general. He didn't do any of this shit. He was just sitting there in the Kremlin, but like, he wasn't pulling the trigger on the Great Purge either, but he does bear some responsibility for that because of his leadership, right? Yeah, you can't have it both ways. Say, like, oh, he, he was in charge of the Purge, but was not in charge of the military, you know? Like, right. he had to have some approval process in both. Exactly, yeah. He, he wasn't on the front lines, but he was in charge, so he does, you know, he gets some of that, gets some of the accolades. One of the other things the Soviets did was help to force Japan to surrender. The common American received history of that is just nukes right yeah 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 but the soviet union invaded manchuria reconquered manchuria defeated japan's um army in china drove them out uh had taken over most of korea well they had taken over korea and actually stopped at the 38th parallel where the americans told them to stop but they could have gone further um and that was you know their defeat on the continent was one of the big reasons why the Japanese realized that continuing was futile and surrendered. So they helped force them to surrender in addition to the atomic bombs. 
Right. Okay. So I had heard something to the extent of like the atomic bomb was overkill. I mean, obviously morally, yes, but even strategically because like they had already been so trounced by that point. Yes. I mean, they had no choice to, but to surrender when the Soviets are over there mopping them up. I mean, the Soviets weren't fighting them through the entire course of the war. And then you're telling me the army that defeated the Nazi war machine is going to turn on you. And you're going to somehow survive that. Plus the Americans who were also freed, they who have been fighting you with one hand tied behind their back. Yeah. And I had read something to the effect of that. The decision to use the atom bomb was then more motivated by like cold war shit of like, Hey, don't fuck with us. Yep. Muscle flex. Okay. That it, sucks. It partially is there at the time. There were people who were arguing about this pretty racialized, um, Mm, oh, the idea of like fight to the last man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that I think, you know, that trafficked well, I think when we were growing up in, in, in like how we were educated about it, like that was not as problematic, I think, as it is now, which is to well, for sure. say people are, I mean, they're different than you. Right. And they just, they have they're this throwing themselves. Yeah. 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 The, the emperor is a literal God. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. That was definitely a part of it. Okay, so I do want to ask some questions, um, because I think there's a lot of misinformation around World War II, like we were just talking about, but also about, like, uh, the Soviet Union's role in it in general. I mean, they were a fucking major player, right? Like, don't they have the most, uh, like, didn't they lose the most people? Yes. The Soviet Union lost more than 26 million people in World Ooh. War II. I wonder what even the next closest would be. <laughs> and you could argue, like, that's proportions, but, like, still... Oh, no, no. I mean, it's it's a uh, 13 percent of their population. That's so many. Holy shit. It's it, percentage wise. It's really high, too. The next closest was China with an upper limit of 20 million, 15 to wow. 20 million. Is that combatants or total? Total. I, I that's total for the Soviet unions, too, because I mean, they're getting fucking decimated by Japan. The next with an upper limit of 7.4 million is Germany. Uh, the United States is down here with 419,000. So we don't even crack the million. Yeah, with 0.32% of our population. 0.32 versus, what was it, 18%? 13%. 13%. And yeah, no, no, but yeah, you're right. What we get is the U.S. and the British we and the French. We saved them all. We came in, we did D-Day, and we saved it. But it was the Soviet Union who won the Second World War. Um, they're the ones that drove back the... It, think about if they had fallen, if... if the Nazis had taken over the vast Soviet Union. <laughs> Gotten all their resources, all their grain, all their factories they just fucking made. We're, we're living in the man in the high castle world. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like they, they saved, they were the MVP, you know, and they liberated half of Europe and yeah, they were, they were the ones and that's not what we're taught. Not at all. Yeah, it is, it is very much a, an American centric story or even yeah like the allies you, you think of just britain and france and america and that's it yeah so britain has the version of like oh the blitz and everything and you know like the wartime spirit which was you know uh important don't for get sure. me wrong but it's uh the extent to which that was the war for them you know and like you also have to consider i'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about post-war stuff like losing 13 percent of your population like what that is decimation <laughs> yes literally it's worse than decimation <laughs> yeah a couple of weak points or the weak point about world war ii for for stalin and soviet union is mass deportations we mentioned that they did this in the baltic states and in poland but other groups were targeted they were accused as a group of treasonous collaboration with nazi germany some of that went on some of you know some people collaborated that's what happened you know but i don't know as a teacher i gotta say like collective punishment is like my least favorite it's very <laughs> not unfair. very effective why should i lose my recess when it wasn't me that was talking you know but they targeted lots of groups the vulgar germans the crimean uh, tatars the crimean greeks the kalmyks the chechens the english the balkers the karachais the bulgarians the romanians the armenians and the meshkatean kurts Jesus. Okay. So like every ethnic group, basically. Yeah. 
if they had any sort of collaboration going on, they were deported en, ma en masse to remote areas of the Soviet Union, with nearly 20% of them dying in a couple of years. Woof. Okay. It's around 100,000, hundreds of thousands, rather, of them deported. Okay. Pretty bad. Yeah. But again, pretty bad what they suffered. Like we said, more than 26 million people dead. More than 13% of their population dead. Millions more than that wounded or orphaned. Oh, yeah. One thing, like a piece of media that I think helped me understand this, just the culture, I think, around it is is watching the Americans. You know, they, whenever they reference the war and, and post-war, it was, it was really interesting to hear kind of the the effects of this of just like, yeah, we're just fucking all starving in Stalingrad. Like that's just what happened. Yeah. Yeah. It was a national trauma. They had all been through tens of thousands of towns and villages had been destroyed like 70 something thousand. Wow. 25 million people were homeless. Electricity production was cut in half. Food production fell. Their last famine, like we said, was in 1947, last to 1948, obviously a result of the war. They had a ton of rebuilding to do, and that's what they set out doing. They did a really good job of that. Yeah. Also, I bet they, like, didn't have a lot of men, you know? Like, yeah. I'm curious to see how that will affect, like, women, you know, getting more into the workforce and, and things like that. Well, there were certainly less, I don't know, oppression, repression, whatever you want to call it, but less of that, like social crackdown like there was before you know they that can't was afford to up. they're like there's no people you can be gay i guess yeah <laughs> and even like the conservative elements of it one of the things that was eased up on during the war was the orthodox church it was like that's fine like we want everyone on board please we're trying to survive you know but yeah no they, they so they rebuilt their army up from in 1949 they had 2.9 million they kept ramping that up by the end of stalin's rule is 5.8 million uh, they built up their life expectancy, so they were caring for their people to, it, this is the longer term statistics, I didn't have the in-betweens, but in 1913, czarist times. Yeah, yeah, what am I looking at? I'm a peasant. You got 32 years. Holy shit, I'm gonna die in like three years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's because you're dying in infancy, but still. Okay, okay, yeah, but still that's bad. By 1956, they had a life expectancy of 63. Yeah, that's a huge jump. It's like a world record in terms of doubling your life expectancy in yeah, that amount of that's, time. That's pretty crazy. By 1950, after having their country destroyed, they had achieved full literacy. You know, again, after losing, you know, 13% of their population. By 1974, this is well after Stalin's time, but he built, you know, the road to this. Remember, we were doing our Life in the Soviet Union episode. 1974 is when they have six days a week child care <laughs> oh, from yeah. 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Oh, my God. Three meals a day and a snack. And a snack. <laughs> In today's money, $72 a week. That's not bad, right? A month. <gasps> a month. Oh, my God. <laughs> As someone who's taking care of a nephew... A, you know, a six-year-old for a few days. I would pay so much more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and we do. We we pay tons for that. We pay. It's like so a mortgage much. payment. You pay the cost of your health, of your education system because that's literally what it's for by policymaker standards. <laughs> that's 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 what they're doing. But yeah, the Soviets put that into place. Again, Stalin didn't do that himself, but. How do they get there from ashes to that, you know? Yeah, yeah. He started the, the wheel. So I guess like what, he started up some sort of mother's program or something, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking about kind of the, the child care provisions and the maternity oh, leave that's and that right. sort of stuff. And like the beginning of the education, stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, from ashes to the space race. Uh, it's, it's, it's 12 years after losing 13% of their population, the Soviets put the first satellite into space. Four more that years after that, nuts. they put the first human being into space. That is nuts. It was after his time, but, you know, shoulders of giants, and Stalin was one of them. You know, given, given that, he was, he killed some people he shouldn't have killed. Lots of them. But also did that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Their rapid advancement is extremely impressive. Yeah. They also accelerated their atomic bomb project. They had started that during the war. They kind of just used espionage and shit and their own scientists to, like, figure it out. They produced their own bomb by 1949. And yes, I don't like nuclear weapons. Not my favorite one. Without it, would we have feared enough to, like, avoid World War Three with the Soviet Union? Good question. Maybe we just decide, hey, as they do in Doctor Stranger, of like, I'm like, I'm not saying we wouldn't get our hair must, Mr. President. You know, uh, <laughs> thirty million, forty million here. It's the price to pay for freedom, but we may have risked it to go to war with them. I don't know. Is there? They're still bad. I mean, you don't want to do nuclear weapons. Yeah, but. I'd rather not. <laughs> but anyway, the Cold War is next. Everyone's favorite. It's super complicated, um, but I'm just focusing on Stalin's highlight. There's like tons of other stuff we could get into, but. For sure. <laughs> um, and we're already going to run long, and that's fine. That's whatever. Yeah. I'll deal yeah. with it. <laughs> Hydrate, take breaks. Yeah. You got this. Uh, 1947, Stalin helped to coordinate the establishment of the people's democracies of Eastern Europe. This is the so called Eastern Bloc. The traditional narrative, you know, oh, Soviet dominance, the Iron Curtain, this monolithic gray totalitarian communism, blah, 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 all that. It's very oversimplified. It's way more varied than that. It should be its own episode sometime in the future. But I just don't like the term Eastern Bloc, so I don't like to use it. Because it makes them sound like they're all assholes, you know? Yeah, it makes it sound like it is it is one, like a dictatorship kind of thing. Yeah. So what was the real story? So basically, the Soviets, you know, they push Germany back and they end up occupying all this land in Eastern Europe. Uh, these countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, all those. Yugoslavia and Albania are in the same like area, but they basically free themselves. They have some help from the Red Army, but they're not occupied. Yeah, that's right. They beat up those Nazis. Mm -hmm. So they kind of chart their, basically their own course. Uh, we talked about that with Tito. These countries are different from each other. Some of them had like literally been Axis countries. Uh, some of them had been occupied by Axis countries or maybe collaborated with them. Like there's, there's different things going on, but Stalin leads the consolidation of the power of the communist parties in these countries. They set up people's republics, um, or socialist republics there. And generally what that looked like is the communist party in a coalition with others would kind of like be the biggest group there they would set up like the, you know the biggest political group would be that sort of a coalition this anti-fascist coalition but with like the communists and leading actual like offices and stuff right and when you say communist are you talking about like i am from this place and i am a communist yeah. or is it i'm sending somebody no so well a mix of them honestly but generally the leaders at least and stuff would be i'm from this place maybe i had training in moscow or something but i'm from this place they, tr they tried to make a domestic grown in that sense there's lots of variety specifics and all that, but that's overall how the process went. These established people's democracies and things did lead to lots of economic benefits for the working people of those countries at the expense of, you know, the opulence of the capitalist classes. And they didn't get to do as much crazy, cool shit that they liked, but that's fine. <laughs> it did also require, you know, the repression of class enemies, this sort of, project was run by party cadres and stuff and they were, they were those were coordinated through and sometimes trained by like we mentioned the soviet union they did also set up their own secret police yeah that's what i was worried about you definitely had that uh they worked to sideline other parties make themselves a one-party state that sort of thing that's there's too much variation to get into like where that doesn't completely describe it but that's the overall picture in the effort to make these republics run by mostly communists and, you know, some lefties or whatever, just a coalition. Yeah. Did, I assume they also deported a lot of, like, fascists. Or maybe executed. I don't know. There were definitely executions. And then those... those Is that the national operations? Uh, the national operations were before that. The executions and stuff and deportations during World War II would have happened through the Red Army and through local partisan groups. So, I mean, you know, for example, in Yugoslavia, Tito did plenty of this. They 
captured up a bunch of fascists that had wiped out some village or whatever, they wiped them out. That's that sort of thing on the local level definitely did happen. I mean, it's fine. They're fascists, like whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, the, the downside to that is, of course, they definitely got some people that that weren't or that were accused or whatever that totally happened. And, you know, for you, sure. Yeah, that that does suck. Yeah. One of the things we have to wrestle with is not so much. You know, because we're not a confessional. We're not sitting here trying to figure out, like, how can we absolve ourselves of sin? What we're trying to figure out is, how can we do better in the future? So that's one of the things we have to deal with is, what would we do? How can we minimize that while still achieving our goals? So that was part of the, like, setup of Eastern Europe or whatever, helping that process get along. And, you know, again, from the Soviet perspective, we're, we're, we're trying to free people from this capitalist dominance and... There is a little bit of like taking away of like bourgeois political freedoms, but the economic advancement is, I think, more the focus. Uh, then you have the Marshall Plan. Usually I'm not a fan of Marshall Plans. Really? You've heard of Marshall Plan before, right? Wait, you mean like the United States Marshall Plan? Yeah, the U.S., the Marshall Plan. Okay, yeah. I was like, well, how did that come in? Okay, explain. <laughs> All right, so the U.S., you know, by this point, they're the undisputed leader of the capitalist West. But their problem is that the Europe that they have liberated is in ruins. The Communist Party is gaining ground in Western Europe, too, especially in France and Italy. Oh, really? Yeah. They were taken off. There were worries that they were going to win their upcoming elections. And they feared that Europe overall would, you know, as they say, fall to communism. Oh, the terrible fate. Yeah. Fall to you know, the guys who were just the MVP of, like, kicking Nazi <laughs> ass. Like, those yeah. guys. The Marshall Plan was the West's answer to that. This is the one where we say, like, it's cool to fight communism, basically. That's more like the Truman Doctrine. Oh, shit. Okay, what's this one? It's interrelated, but the Marshall Plan set up the Economic Cooperation Administration, through which the United States primarily would pump money and goods and services into the governments of Western Europe. Okay. And it was just to prop them up so they wouldn't go communist. Yeah. So those governments would then loan that money out to businesses in their local currency. 60% of it had to be devoted to industry because they wanted the industry to be rebuilt. And then the businesses had to repay those loans. And then that money would be used to loan out to more businesses or to pay for bigger rebuilding projects but it's a stimulus package for Western Europe. Yeah, this doesn't sound good. It wasn't. I mean, it was good in the sense, in the cold hard sense of like helping people out of poverty in a way. But it was in a way that was tightly tied to American business interests. Yeah, like that had to have come with some fucking strings. Oh, yeah. The Economic Cooperation Administration, they had envoys in each country, which were prominent American businessmen. So, yeah, you know, if you had donated enough, I guess, to, <laughs> then you could be one of these guys. Oh, you could set up your little fiefdom. Like, do you want to go live in France and make them all make shit for you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, because the governments had to, like, the countries had to get, had to, they had to use their funds in ECA-approved ways. Okay. So it couldn't be for things like health care. Well, yeah, you had to, well, if you could prove that this was, you know, somehow going to stop a godless communist from taking over your country, maybe. But it was more so like build a factory. Yeah, exactly. So one example, the Europeans, they wanted to use their funds to build oil refineries. But U.S. oil companies came and complained to the ECA saying, hey, we're going to make less money. Oh, my God. It's fucking open veins all over yeah, again. Basically. But with Europe. Yeah, they did open veins light to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> light and only light because these guys aren't brown oh, yeah so. <laughs> exactly also another wow. beautiful thing about this is that five percent of its funds went directly to the cia what yep the cia got the pocket five percent of those funds literally and they use that to finance secret operations in europe supporting anti-communist labor unions newspapers student groups those sorts of things. Wow, wow, wow. Cool. Yeah. Uh, another 
CIA operation that was going on at the time that almost certainly got some of the dollars, or at least some of those dollars were freed up to go toward this was Operation Gladio. We talked about this in our Operation Condor episode, uh, the stay behind networks that worked with Nazis uh, to do false flag operations and frame communists for things or fight communists in the event of an invasion or whatever. These sort of like secret networks and stuff throughout Europe. Wow. 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 Yeah. Cool. Weird how the CIA is always hanging out with business <laughs> interests. Friend of the Super show. weird. CIA, go on Teach Me Communism. We'd love to talk. <laughs> you guys oh. listen. I know you listen. Dave and Dan, they give you great Hard reports, but there's nothing better, no better research than just coming on and talking with us, you know? I'm saying talk with air quotes and like picture Tony Soprano saying it. Like, <laughs> I just, just want to talk. <laughs> I just want to talk. That's all. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the Marshall Plan was super successful economically. You see like the fastest growth in European history in terms of the economy. It's politically successful, too, because they were trying to beat back the communist threat. And, Menace. Yeah, and they do. You know, they reduce the communist popularity throughout. They also do that CIA bullshit to rig the Italian elections and everything to make sure mm. that they don't win. <laughs> cool. Yeah, they do a lot of stuff. But where does Stalin come into this? So Stalin yeah. rejects participation in the Marshall Plan, which was extended to both Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Interesting. And he sees, he kind of sees through. He's like, come on. Yeah, guys. he's like, uh, I'm not going to take your money. Like, you're, you're clearly going to use it for bad things. Yeah, you're paying me how much to let the CIA in? Like, guys, <laughs> you know. I'm not stupid. I already think you guys are here. Like, <laughs> I'm definitely <laughs> I'm not, not. going to open the door for you. <laughs> right. You know, but just to bend over to let them, to let them take you for everything. And, and, and the Soviet Union called the U.S. out as a, as a, I love this quote, fascizing power. Fascizing. Ooh. Yeah. At the center of worldwide reaction and anti-Soviet activity. Which, I mean, yeah. they ain't wrong. <laughs> uh, the rest of the People's Republics rejected the Marshall Plan as well. Some of them had to be coaxed by Stalin beforehand. He was like, are you fucking serious? You're trying to... <laughs> no. And instead, they were helped by the Molotov Plan. Cooler name. It sounds destructive, but it's just named after the guy. This later becomes the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, the Comic-Con, which was formed in 1949. Different from our Comic-Con. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The general pattern here was that the Soviet Union provided Eastern Europe with like raw goods, like oil and minerals and stuff, as well as like military protection, right? Uh, while Eastern Europe provided the Soviet Union with finished machinery and more consumer goods. That sounds good. So yeah, kind of like a trading network. Yeah. And it's, I think, a little bit different from kind of your classic imperialist setup where you are just taking raw goods and getting refined goods from like the home country yeah it's almost reverse of that now they were getting from some of these countries like war reparations because they had worked with the axis okay powers. yeah so there, there was an imbalance i don't want to frame it the other way but generally speaking eastern europe was materially a little more advanced than all but like the city centers of the soviet union all right next up we don't have to go into depth on this one because we've covered it before. The Tito-Stalin split. Mm, okay. Refresh my memory on this one. All right, this was June 1948, where Tito was trying to do some foreign policy moves, make some friends nearby with Albania and Bulgaria. And oh, yeah, yeah. Stalin kept being like, no, what the fuck? Like, you guys aren't asking us at all. You're trying to do this nationalist bullshit. And Tito was like, what, man? They're my bros. Eventually, they go to the common form and say, Tito is an asshole. He doesn't believe the right things. And they make it out to be this big ideological confrontation, but really it's like a, a geopolitical one. And so they kick him out of the international communist group. And they're just like, Tito, you fucking suck. Get out of here. Oh, my God. That's what makes Yugoslavia, like, turn to the West, actually, and, and, and start yeah. getting some aid from the United States. Fucking oh, crazy shit. Yeah. But Stalin, on his end, he, he takes to the airwaves and starts denouncing Tito everywhere he can. <laughs> this guy's bullshit. You know, he sucks. And he also starts purging Titoists from anyone who agreed, you know, from the Soviet Union, 
Eastern European socialist countries start doing this too. And it's bloody stuff, just like on the other side with the with the inform bureau period where Tito was going after Stalinists, it's the same thing. Right. You know, generally that bad sucks. for the movement. Yeah. I'll put it on the list. <laughs> Uh, in June 1948, the same month, same year, you have the Berlin Airlift. You ever heard of this? No. What the fuck is that? All right. So Germany, right? After the war, they're divided in, into the occupation zones. The Soviets have like what becomes East Germany. And then the British, the French, and the U.S. have West Germany, different little zones. And then within the Soviet zone, you have Berlin also divided into those into mirror zones like that. So the Soviets started blockading West Berlin, the British, French, American area. They started blockading it, all the roads in or out, the rail in or out. Why'd they do that? It was basically over a currency dispute slash like Cold War tensions or whatever. It's like, I mean, I mean, seriously on the level of like Star Wars episode one trade disputes shit. You know? Oh my God. <laughs> so very boring. Yes. Okay. So the West is like, fuck, okay. Uh, they start just flying tons of supplies into West Berlin, which had been agreed upon on paper, signed and everything before all this happened, that there were always going to be these three air corridors into West Berlin. The ground paths had just been an understanding, a goodwill thing. But the Soviets weren't going to break like an actual thing they had signed. So the West starts, the Berlin airlift is they're flying more than 2 million tons of supplies over nearly a year into West Berlin to keep them from, you know, giving in and, and giving up to, to East Germany. And it's during this time, during this like blockade and stuff that NATO, everyone's favorite nowadays, NATO uh -oh. was formed. It was in April, 1949. I mean, it was a defense pact. It was a military alliance aimed at. So I don't, I don't know how defensive you can call it if it's aimed at someone, but uh, <laughs> it was aimed at the Soviet Union. Everybody but them. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. When you find out all of your friends are going to a party that you weren't invited to. Oh, yeah. there's a group chat just called not them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the Soviets response was to do the opposite group chat. So, but this takes a while. This is 1955. By the time they formed the Warsaw Pact, but that's like the oh, NATO yeah, yeah. opposite. It's only a couple of weeks after the blockade was lifted, which was in May 1949, that the Soviets said, well, fuck, if y'all are going to keep flying in, that's fine. A couple of weeks after that, that the Western occupation zones are united into the Federal Republic of Germany, which is called West Germany capitalist West Germany. And then later that year, the Soviet occupation zone becomes the German Democratic Republic, popularly known as East Germany. The true division of Germany happens at that time. It's interesting. Apparently Stalin proposed to reunify Germany in March of 1952. Really? Yeah. He wanted a free, demilitarized, neutral, democratic Germany. And it doesn't sound bad. He sent like a diplomatic note to the West, the democratic countries there or whatever. And they said, yeah, uh, we can do that if we a rearm Germany and B let them join military alliances like NATO. Whoa. What in what way would that be smart? <laughs> yeah, that's what Stalin said. And that's what the Soviet Union said. And they were like, no, <laughs> hey, f fuck that. Yeah, guys, it's been like 10 years. Maybe we don't give them guns right away. So, yeah, people look back on this and they're like, well, that, I mean, that was like nearly 40 years before we reunified Germany again. Maybe we could have done that sooner. <laughs> <laughs> that is wild. So my man had a maybe good idea there. I don't know. Uh, October 1949, the People's Republic of China proclaimed... Hey, we're around now. We won the Civil War. Big win for Mao. Big win for the Chinese people. Big win for the Soviet Union. They had aided in terms of money, in terms of supplies, personnel. They've been instrumental in keeping the Communist Party of China going during that long Civil War. We mentioned the mistakes they made already, but like, big deal. Uh, 1950, you have the war in Korea. This 
should probably be its own episode one day, so we're not going to say much. <laughs> it happens. Uh, but basically, at the end of World War II, the U.S. divided Korea on the 38th parallel. They outsourced this to some State Department underlings. Uh, future top presidential advisor, Dean Rusk, um, which is used as a, a national geographic map to pick out a parallel. Okay. Seems really smart. He picks out like the furthest North that he thinks that reasonably speaking, American troops can get to. And he's just like, ah, eh, you know, hopefully you can get that Let's far. Let's see if we can get away with it. Yeah. He was try desperately trying to get Seoul, the capital in that. Um, and so that's what they did. It was the same line that Tsarist Russia and Imperial Japan had drawn on there. So it was kind of kind wow. of a bad line to draw. Yeah, for sure. So they did just divide it in half that way. The Soviets occupied the northern half. Like I said, they waited to let the Americans take the southern half. Uh, they supported the People's Republic of Korea, which was like a domestic sort of leftist resistance group that had been fighting the Japanese all along. And eventually they grow that into the People's Committee of North Korea because they're limited to just the northern half, right? This was headed by Soviet-trained Kim Il-sung, who becomes like the, the first leader of, you know, the country known as North Korea. Uh, and they do land reform. They confiscate and redistribute 52% of the land area to hundreds of thousands of households. They nationalize 90% of industry. They do an eight-hour workday. Uh, they ban child labor, they implement equal pay, they do social insurance and gender equality. Some good stuff. That all sounds good. <laughs> We're going to have to get into that at a later date. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Soviet forces leave in 1948. In the South, meanwhile, the U.S. takes that People's Republic of Korea thing and they outlaw it. They're like, these guys are communists. They fucking <laughs> suck. They're just, they outlaw them. We're not doing that. <laughs> they are supposed to have elections to reunify the country, but the Soviet Union and the U.S. failed to agree on that. It's very complicated stuff I want to dive into later. But essentially, August 1948, South Korea, the Republic of Korea, was formed as kind of a right-wing country. And then the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, the DPRK, popularly known as North Korea, was formed as a socialist country. And so then later, 1950, the war breaks out. Very complicated. There's a lot of skirmishes beforehand. The overall course is that the North nearly just wipes out the South. Then the South pushes back way up into the North. And then China comes in and is like, hey, y'all stop fucking around. <laughs> and so it like wades, it kind of like balances into a stalemate. That was bullshit military history for me. <laughs> it was like, it, that is how it happens. But that's like years and years. 50,000 foot life. view. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stalin's Soviet Union sent aid in terms of personnel, in terms of supplies and all that. Overall, it wasn't that direct in comparison to what they could have poured in, and this leaves a bad taste in China's mouth. Uh, they kind of say, hey. Like, why are we the ones dealing with this? Yeah, are y'all some fake friends? Like, y'all act like you like us, but come on. Yeah, yeah. So this kind of pushes them initially down that road that will lead to the... Sino split. Yep. No. It gets them thinking along those lines of, hey, are these guys like our friends or not? In May 1948, Stalin's Soviet Union is the first country to grant de jure diplomatic recognition to Israel. Interesting. Yeah. Kind of a boo for me, but... Yeah. Uh, they were trying to get an ally in the region. They also convinced Czechoslovakia, which was one of the Eastern European socialist states, to sell arms to them. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, this quickly changes because Israel's like, Hey, United States, what's up? And so the Soviets are like, well, fuck you then. And well, okay. Yeah. I thought you might be cool, but I guess not. Yeah. So they switched to supporting the Arab states in the region instead. All right. We're to the conclusion. Oof. Stalin's about done. Okay. Got, just got to get a few, a couple, a couple more purges out of the way and that's it. <laughs> He's got a few left in him. Late 1948, Stalin and the Soviet Union figure out, oh, hey, Israel, they don't like us anymore. They're with the West. But what they translate this over into is saying, hmm, hey, Jewish people living in the Soviet Union may be oh, a no, potential no, no, no. security liability. God dang it, guys. You guys got to figure out that, like, ethnicity is not the same thing as, like, <laughs> like you are a spy. 
Yeah. Yup. Oh, my God. But they hadn't figured that out yet. So January 1949, the Soviet Union starts a public campaign against <clears throat> rootless cosmopolitanism, which is a coded way of referring to Soviet Jews. That sucks. Rootless. They do not have a home cosmopolitanism being a citizen of the world rather than being of the Soviet Union. So saying that they are less than completely loyal to the Soviet Union and then playing on anti-Semitic tropes of like the wandering Jewish person or whatever. So that's on the strike list. Yeah. Uh, many Soviet Jews were fired from their jobs or unofficially banned from certain jobs. Jesus. Not good. No, really not good. It would only get worse. Oh, okay. In 1948, you had the doctor's plot. Oh, I think we talked about this. I don't remember it. Yeah. Is this when, like, Stalin didn't like his doctors, and so he <laughs> killed some? Sort of. Okay, yeah. sorry. It's, it's a little more complicated than that, but, like, here's what it is. A Soviet medical worker named Lydia Timoshuk in 1948 wrote a letter to Stalin's head of security saying, Hey. There are some doctors that are intentionally fucking up their diagnosis and shit to kill prominent Soviet leaders. That launched an investigation. Stalin at first was like, that sounds like bullshit, but whatever. Investigate it, I guess. You know? And so a guy named Mikhail Ryuman of the MGB, the secret police at the time, investigates this and captures and then interrogates via torture a guy named Yakov Ettinger, a Jewish cardiologist. The reason is because he had treated Soviet politicians Andrei Zhadanov and Alexander Sherbakov, both of whom had died of heart disease after having been treated by them. Like, this is normal. People with heart disease come to doctors and then, like, they die because they had heart disease. That happens, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the investigation torturing this guy. Oh my gosh. Ryuman's boss. The MGV, you know, officer, his boss tells him, hey, that guy's old. If you keep torturing him like that, he's going to die. Quit. Ryuman says, okay. But then he goes and tortures the guy some more and oh the guy dies. Oh my gosh. Okay. So he gets in trouble. He's like, I told you not to torture that guy. And he died, you know, because you did it anyway. Like you asshole. So Ryuman writes a letter to Stalin. <gasps> did he say that this guy was like secretly part of the plot? Uh-huh. So in July 1951, he accuses his boss oh my gosh. of killing Ettinger to cover up a plot by Jewish terrorist doctors <gasps> to assassinate Soviet leadership. What the fuck, guys? So big strike for Mikhail Ryuman. Yeah, for sure. Strike number one, two, and three. Okay, so the boss gets fired and replaced by Semyon Ignatiev. And Stalin tells him, hey... This guy, Ryuman, let him do his thing. You know, investigate. Let him investigate. And clean the place up, please. Come on. So Ignatiev, in a year, he fires some 42,000 MGB officers. Uh, he arrests every Jewish person that works there. Oh, my God. And in September 1952, they arrest people connected to this doctor's plot. 37 people are arrested and tortured into revealing, you know, even more conspirators. That's pretty, I mean, like, let's be honest, those are pretty low numbers. They are, but it's still really stupid. It's stupid, but, like, Stalin's frustration here was like, I'm sorry, you have 37 guys for me? <laughs> That's not enough murders. Yeah, so he thinks this is a wider plot. We are going really slowly at uncovering this. Instead of thinking, oh, there's only 37 guys, there must not be a real plot. He's thinking, there's only 37 guys, there must be a huge plot. Yeah, or <laughs> what, what am I missing? Yeah. Okay. He's, you know, he's really trying to figure out how can he get to the bottom of this and, and make sure that this is rooted out or whatever in his, in his eyes. Obviously, there's, you know, it, it sucks, but it almost certainly wasn't, I mean, I don't think it was a real thing, you know? Yeah, there's no way. <laughs> People also go out and say, well, I think that maybe he was using ju this just as a pretext to try to gin up another purge, you know, like, oh, he was about to really let loose 
And I think that it could have slid into that direction. I don't think he would have just intentionally been like, I haven't killed people in a while. Time to do it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he definitely was overreacting and it probably could have gotten worse, but it did not. The reason is Stalin was not very healthy at this time. He had had a heart attack and a mild stroke in 1945. Oh, is this one of our, he like isn't able to be treated because he got rid of all the fucking doctors? Uh, sort of. Yeah, that's a little blown somewhat out of proportion. Oh, okay, he had okay. gotten rid of, of of the doctors that were vetted and had trusted by the... Mm, yeah. okay, okay. So somewhat. By 1950, he was taking longer holidays for his health. He suffered from atherosclerosis from smoking. And he, he really just wasn't the best patient to deal with, as you can tell from the doctor's plot. Yeah. <laughs> One of the doctors imprisoned as part of that plot uh, was... Someone he had gone to a checkup uh, for in 1951 who recommended, you know, because, hey, his health and everything, that he should retire. Mm, okay. And Stalin was like, um, maybe you should retire. <laughs> Welcome to this prison camp. To prison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Not who you want in the in the exam chair. Definitely not. I'd be like, you're, <laughs> you're perfectly healthy. You're doing great. <laughs> or what was it? Trump's doctor is like the healthiest person I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But really, his health wasn't great. He he couldn't give many speeches or write much. He was also clearly thinking about who would replace him going forward. So like he was on his way out. March 1st, 1953. It kind of happens like the movie shows it in Death of Stalin. Um, he was found unconscious on the floor of his bedroom. He had suffered a cerebral hemorrhage. He was treated in a variety of ways. At one point, they put leeches on him to try to lower his blood pressure. Whoa, guys. I thought we were, like, better at literacy and shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and none of this works. March 5th, 1953, Joseph Stalin died. There he goes. R.I.P. to a real one. Um, some people... <laughs> a real something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some people suspected that Lavrenti Beria, uh, the, well, the secret police guy by that point, had poisoned him. But there is like zero, there, there's not real evidence to that. Okay, okay. And it doesn't turn out well for Beria, so it's hard to make that argument. Stalin's body is embalmed and displayed at the House of Unions for three days. Oh, yeah, the big, like, processional to go see his body and stuff. Yeah, yeah, big ceremonies. The crowds were so bad that more than 100 people were actually killed in a crush. That's right, yeah. And, like I said, afterward... Kind of like we talked about in the Death of Stalin episode. There's lots of maneuvering, lots of political shit. One thing that comes to an end is the doctor's plot. There's also mass releases from the gulag. There's other big policy changes. And eventually, uh, Nikita Khrushchev is the one who comes to power. He ends up delivering the secret speech in 1956, denouncing Stalin. To be honest, it's mostly for his own consolidation of power, his own benefit. And he starts the policies of like de-Stalinization, the Khrushchev thaw, winding down a lot of the more heavy handed things that Stalin had put in place. I mean, I'm not opposed to some of those things, probably. Well, that's where we come to a close. That's the end of Stalin's life and the end of this episode. What do we want to discuss? Let's try to pick out some themes. So I'm looking through his strike list. <laughs> it's, it's pretty long. It does mm -hmm. require some scrolling on the user's part. <laughs> I mean, my biggest like recurring theme, and I think the way he is often characterized is like through some paranoia, just in terms of like how many fucking purges there are. We've already kind of talked about this in, in discussing the Great Purge in general, but it, it is the, the argument of, well, this is for security. That's why we're doing this. Maybe, you know, they probably got some people who actually were plotting but, I mean, to me, I, I am kind of a moralist. You said that you aren't, but mm -hmm. I just, I don't think any of that is worth it. I think that just turns people against you. I think it is just super dangerous and, and really, I mean, especially the Jewish stuff is like, guys, what do, what did we just finish doing? You know? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> like, you don't think that, like is a little shitty. <laughs> I mean, it's extremely shitty, but like, it's just, it's crazy. It's like, guys, we just had World War II. Could we maybe not do that? Yeah, that's true. I, I do think that everything's nuanced, right? I, I think it's fairly misguided and like a sort of elite 
way to look at a privileged way to look at in our monitor scores, maybe a privileged way to look at, um, conflict and revolutions and things like that in terms of means and ends in the abstract sense, you know, you do have to look at like, okay, well, in respect to what are my ends, what means are then on the table? So like if I'm fighting for fascism, the means that are able, that you are able to employ in that and still like come out like as good is zero or zero. Like you can't do that because it's fascism. But if I'm fighting for communism, like that expands in a large, yeah, but, but then there are, like you're saying, there are things that you can do that like are just maybe n they're not acceptable. They taint the project overall is what you're saying. I think that is what I'm saying is, is that like, if at the end of the day you find yourself, you know, rounding up ethnic groups and deporting them and executing them and all that shit, like, what the fuck are you doing? You've, yeah, you've gained the world but lost your soul. You lost the plot. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, though, because, like, you know, earlier we were talking about the economic plans and, like, the famine and, like, the instability that kind of came from that. I was much more okay with those kinds of sacrifices because in my head I was like, well, economically you had to restructure your food and your industrial organization. Like you just had to do that. And I don't know. I don't know why that is so much easier for me to dismiss of like, well, that's a cost. It's because it was a class. I mean, you were, you're not going after any ethnic. That, that's what hung you up. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Because even, even some of the purge stuff. I was much more willing to forgive, like, yeah, we got rid of some kulaks. Yeah, fucking fine. I don't care. Like, not my, I would prefer you didn't murder them, but like, it's cool, I guess, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, because they, they had a choice to say, actually, I'll work with you. With the ethnic groups thing, you don't have a choice to be like, well, I'll just stop being Jewish, you know? Like, that's not how that works. Yeah, no, that was, I listened to a, a podcast episode by the now defunct Proles of the Round Table, and one they did with Rev Left, and they were talking about some of the strikes they had on Stalin, you know, as you would put it. And I mean, they're, they're, you know, tankier than now they're, they're, they're further <laughs> left than I am, or, you know, better Stalin, better defenders of Stalin than I am. And that was one of the things is, is that mess, that collective punishment and, and the, in the, in the deportation of ethnic groups that they were like, mm, no, like, nope, you didn't need to good, do that, you know? And, and, I, and I think that's, that's a good way to look at it is there's, there's some things that you just then no, like you don't need to defend, you know, like it's, it's, yeah, you don't people come out and they, they say, well, if I can tear down any little bit about Stalin, I've somehow stricken a blow against communism and we're not, we're just not doomed. We're not, we're not doomed to do what our leaders have done in the past, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like let's take what we can learn from this and move on. Like we've, we've given a lot of, Hey, don't do this in this, in this series of episodes of like, Hey, maybe, maybe don't do that. I mean, if someone comes out of this thinking we're endorsing Stalin, like, well, I don't, I don't know what you did. You did some skipping <laughs> around, I guess. Yeah, you missed your 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 headphones are cutting out. <laughs> your AirPods are dying. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I, I guess what I'm saying, like, that that is definitely a major theme for me. Is is just I'm very uncomfortable with with warfare that is not class warfare or anti-fascist warfare. Like, like that is definitely not okay some of the social issues too obviously i was not a fan of no terrible of yeah. the, the rollback on on women's rights and gay rights and things like that i understand some of the i guess the shitty reasoning behind it at least they were open about like yeah we just want more population <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's really bad but like i i guess i kind of get it but like there's i mean abortion Restricting abortion just like causes death. Like there's, no, yeah. there's no other way to do that. And they literally found that out, you know, the hard way. The Soviet Union did eventually re re-legalize abortions. Oh, do they? Yeah, but after Stalin's time. Um. Yeah, guys, abortions save lives. Who knew? Um, yep. Yeah, everybody. Uh, <laughs> everybody knew. The third theme that I'm seeing in, in my strikes is the ruthlessness of war. And, you know, I'm always wishy-washy on that. Like... You know, some of those like never surrender, you know, that kind of stuff in World War Two. It's like, I mean, yeah, that sucks. But what the fuck else are you going to do? You're fighting literal Hitler, you know, like maybe, maybe desperate times, you know. And they won. And yeah, they fucking kicked ass. You got to give them that. They were the ones. Again, Americans, you don't get this. <laughs> you know, you're on the left, hopefully. So you've, you've, you've experienced a little bit of it. It's, it's, I think it's still a slow process. Like. 
you start out by saying, oh, the Soviets, they, they played a real role. And then slowly you figure out like, no, they were the main ones. You know, They did like a lot of the work, guys. <laughs> yeah. Like, and how did they do that? Yeah, they, they won a war, so they won it cruelly. I mean, everyone wins a war cruelly. It's, it's exterminating another human life. I mean, like it's someone who signed up, maybe signed up to go kill you. Maybe it's someone who was forced to go kill you or they would be killed. You know, it's, it's all hell. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's no way to come out of that with your hands clean. And I would argue like, if not all of these strikes, a lot of these strikes have not to say like, oh, it's okay because somebody mm -hmm. else did it. But like other people do these things too. You know, you want to talk about purges? Like, let's talk to our good pals at the CIA. You know, <laughs> you want to talk about abolishing women's rights? Like, I mean, hello, are you, have you Amy been awake? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, welcome out of your coma. This is now what our country is, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, a lot of this stuff, you know, internment camps we, we brought up as well. Like, that is a thing the United States did, you know, on the Japanese people. Like, that's not okay. And I'm, again, I'm not saying, like, well, it's pure whataboutism kind of stuff. But no. I, I, it is telling that we only seem to focus on, on one side of the uh, list of offenses. For sure. I think one thing that I hope we, I hope you guys can take from this is, like, the Stalin's story, understanding it, can, can if we interpret it the right way, help us build left unity? I think so. Like, that is really the, or the thing that I, I was hoping for, where I got really frustrated in the story, were the points of distrust and, and lack of unity, of saying, oh, like, we gotta fight fascism. Oh, just kidding. We're gonna, like, not fight fascism, you know, and then wiping out boom and like just stuff where it's like, guys, like, come on, we, we should all be working together here. There's, we know who the bad guys are. They're literally like, they're fascists. Like, let's go get them. Yeah. <laughs> that should have been a no brainer. And eventually they got there, but like, it's frustrating to have to see that kind of infighting. And even with like the ethnic group stuff, like mm -hmm. you could have been working to, and you had been, you had set up the groundwork to say like, look, we're working together in this great project. Like, look how good we're doing and just like have that kind of trust that your people are going to have your back. Yeah. There was another, uh, a road not taken in each of those situations. And I think also to deal with the history we've been dealt, right? There's an aspect of left unity of like, cause we like, yeah, come on, we're left. We like to divide <laughs> ourselves into an <laughs> infinite number of subcategories and whatnot. I think our, you know, one of our first episodes was like, Oh, which, category are you in and everything yeah like maybe don't go back and listen to that one maybe maybe not <laughs> maybe focus on just like being on the left you know yeah, um good enough i mean especially right now as we are seeing a, a rise in, in fascist tendencies like yeah work with anyone who's against that <laughs> well because because here's here's my point i guess if you think about you know all the arguments we get into online or whatever and saying oh so and so supports stalin or so and so doesn't uphold Stalin or so-and-so, you know, is a lousy liberal because they said Stalin did this bad thing or so-and-so, you know, is a tanky because they praised Stalin's thing in this. Like, look, I do hope that after listening to all this, you say, look, Stalin did some very good things. Yeah. And I hope that you, in listening to this, say, look, Stalin did some very bad things. Oh, yeah. And you don't use that to condemn either side of our project. You use that to say, I'm an anarcho-communist. I'm, I'm sitting here talking to, you know, a, a Marxist-Leninist. And they're telling me why, you know, Stalin's achievements or whatever. Like, I mean, like, you can you can listen with empathy and, and see why does this person appreciate Stalin and everything. And, and understand that they're not necessarily endorsing the deportation of uh ethnic groups that they're not endorsing the abolition of you know we don't have to use every piece against each other right and so when you're a marxist leninist and you're talking to an anarchist or whatever and you're saying like well this person doesn't like stalin well maybe they don't like stalin because of these bad things that he did <coughs> you get that like our current struggle is does involve the lessons that we've learned from history but they are not centered on our judgment of the whole, you know, the, the sins and, uh, achievements of historical figures, if that makes sense. 
I mean, this is the issue, I think, with, with the way we're taught history as a whole is, like, it's good guys and bad guys. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> we're, we're just now starting to get better about that. And, you know, our country can't fucking handle it. It's called critical race theory, and we got to get rid of it, apparently. <laughs> so uh, people have a really hard time with nuance and with understanding, like, yeah, someone can do good and bad, and, like, that doesn't mean you have to throw away the whole person. In Stalin's case, like, yeah, I mean, I do want to emphasize, like, this this massive industrialization, the massive leap in literacy and life expectancy, you know, again, that, that whole idea of rising from the ashes of war to go to fucking space. Yeah. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like, yeah, we don't want to, like, totally throw out everything. Like, there's definitely things you can we can learn of like, all right, maybe collectivization is a good way to go. Like it seemed to work. Okay. Like that kind of stuff. We can totally take specifics that worked in that time and, and see if they could apply to our time. Again, you have to make sure it works for the time. Cause you know, yeah. shit's different now. It's histor- historical materialism. He, he literally wrote the chapter on the book of that. <laughs> that was his favorite <laughs> chapter. So yeah, I mean, I, I think mixed bag for sure. And I, I mean, I'll totally admit this guy's gotten the most strikes out of any biography we have done in the two years of doing this podcast. I'll be honest. If you're still in the mode of like, you know, giving just a thumbs up or a thumbs down after accumulating the strikes, this is a thumbs down, right? Like this is a thumbs down. Like I, I think he did some really heinous shit, but this, I can't even give him a full thumbs down though, Mm -hmm. because then I'm like, well, I mean, he beat Hitler. (laughs) Yeah. You can't reject (laughs) everything. You know, like, that's just not how that works. And you can make the argument like, yeah, someone else would have stepped up and beat Hitler, I guess. But like, maybe, maybe. And also you could say maybe that same person would do the same kind of purges and shit. Like, we don't fucking know. And think about so. what you're asking. Yeah. What, what you would be asking someone to do is someone, someone growing up just, you know, abject poverty as a peasant or whatever. And, you know, they, that's how many of their siblings had starved to death and whatnot. And then here comes someone who, you know rebuilds their country and you know their child is like in the space program and shit i know it's like it's wild the transformation that people saw under him and then just expect to be like oh yeah you know he was an asshole because he killed somebody you know yeah yeah and it it is so drastic again i I would really recommend the americans for kind of getting that generational gap i think is fascinating yeah yeah now that i'm thinking about it that is (laughs) that's what i was (laughs) describing there (laughs) Oh, in conclusion, extremely, extremely mixed bag. Like, I literally can't give a thumbs up or thumbs down. Like, I lean towards thumbs down because, like, those were really heinous shit. But extremely, extremely high levels of drip on his mustache. His mustache is on point. (laughs) I mean, he has a great mustache. It looks really robust. Like, (laughs) yeah, it's a that's a hell of a mouth. It's bussin', as they say. (laughs) Get out. Leave the call. <laughs> Go away. Oh, okay. All right. Next week, what are we talking about? Next week, we're going back to the mailbag, doing a, our summertime listener Q&A. So send in those questions, email, social media, whatever is easiest for you. And we'll see if we can get to them. I think we have a couple saved up from last time, but I, I don't really remember. I haven't dived in lately. Yeah. And if you want to send feedback or uh screeds or (laughs) praise or whatever you want you know send it in we like it totally fine love it i only have limited interaction with it so i can say i like it but (laughs) (laughs) great then i will see you next week all right bye bye Hey there, comrades. Just jumping in to remind you of all of our social media. We are on Twitter at Teach Communism, Instagram at Teach Me Communism. You can shoot us an email. That's teachmecommunism at gmail.com. Any of those places are good to send us an episode suggestion or a question, anything you think would be useful feedback for us or just your admiration. If you want to admire us in a public manner, and you should, you can go to Apple Podcasts to give us a review. It is the best way to help people find the show. Love when people write and review us. Please do both. We are also on YouTube if that's how you prefer to listen to podcasts, or if you know someone that's the only way they'll listen to podcasts, send them to our page. And we have a Patreon. For five bucks a month, you get access to our notes for each week's episode, including the backlog of notes, which is a very handy resource for up and coming commies. And at the end of the year, all of the funds from Patreon will be given to local mutual aid in the DFW area. So, ain't going to line our pockets. 
finally, we have merch. Check us out at Tee Public. You can find shirts and I believe also stickers and magnets and all kinds of fun stuff with catchphrases from the show or episode art, stuff like that. The link to that store is in the show notes, so check that out. Okay, that's all the internet. Join us next time for another episode of Teach Me Communism, where the class struggle is always in session. Bye, y'all.